look at a couple other modified nucleotides that in their own rights are quite important. So we've looked at the nucleotide triphosphates, and we've looked at GTP, which is one of the nucleotide triphosphates. Now let's look at another important family. And this family of modified nucleotides are also involved in regulating cellular processes and physiological processes. And they work too by activating a certain types of proteins. And we call these nucleotides the cyclic nucleotides. And there's two kinds. There's one called cyclic. The lowercase c stands for cyclic, called cyclic AMP and cyclic GMP. Now, what is a cyclic nucleotide? We'll start out with cyclic AMP. Cyclic GMP is the same, except you have guanine instead of adenine. Okay, let's start out with a regular nucleotide AMP, adenosine monophosphate. And here we'll have cyclic AMP. Okay, AMP. We have the sugar, five carbon sugar ribose. We have the base adenine. I'll just represent that by A here. And then we have the phosphate ion. Okay, that's AMP. Adenosine, adenosine refers to the adenine plus ribose. Mono, single phosphate. Now, what is cyclic AMP? Well, what does the term cyclic refer to? Anybody? Nice SAT verb with that question. They say something is cyclic. What does that refer to? A circle. It has something to do with a circle. Well, what does this thing have to do with a circle? Well, we are going to make a circle in this molecule. And the way we're going to do it is we're going to make a circle out of that phosphate ion here. So what we do here to make cyclic AMP is we have the phosphate ion. And what we're going to do is take this oxygen here and covalently bond it right back to the carbon above the other one where the phosphate came off. So our phosphate ion is twisted around in a circle to make cyclic AMP. Now, it's a, or the same thing with cyclic GMP. Now, there's a little issue with this. First of all, it turns out that each covalent bond has a certain angle. You probably heard, remember from chemistry about bond angles. When you twist that phosphate around like that, you're putting tremendous, you're stretching those bond angles about to the limit. It's kind of like wrenching somebody's arm behind their back. You're putting those covalent bonds under a great deal of stress. So a couple things here. It takes a lot of energy to do this because not only are you doing a condensation reaction here, to make this covalent bond, but you also have to twist and wrench and arm twist that phosphate to be able to turn it into a circular thing anyway. So it takes a great deal of energy. As a matter of fact, it takes so much energy that the starting source of cyclic AMP is ATP. You have to take the ATP, cyclic GMP is the same thing, you have to take the ATP. You have to tear the last, the second, and the third phosphates off to provide the energy to make cyclic AMP, and then you re release the two phosphates together as pyrophosphate. So that's another example of a reaction that is so endergonic that just tearing one phosphate off of ATP is insufficient. Now likewise, if you want to make cyclic GMP, you have to start out with a GTP and do the same thing. And of course, enzymes have to catalyze it. Okay, so these are cyclic nucleotides. Now, second thing is once you make that covalent bond, that covalent bond is under a great deal of stress. You're twisting that molecule and make directions it's not your mama told you never to do. Okay, you get that molecule twisted around pretty bad shape. 
That covalent bond's under a lot of stress, and for a covalent bond, it's relatively weak, meaning it's pretty easy to hydrolyze. As a matter of fact, at room temperature or body temperature, it will hy often hydrolyze spontaneously. If I were to take a vial of purified cyclic AMP, which is fearsomely expensive, it's hundreds of dollars a gram, and left it out in the lab overnight at room temperature, chances are a good portion that would hydrolyze by itself at room temperature back into regular AMP. So if you get some purified cyclic AMP, which you can do, you get that stuff, you store it in a freezer. The colder the better because that slows down molecular motion and it keeps the bond from spontaneously hydrolyzing. Now, of course, enzymes can catalyze and cause extremely rapid hydrolysis. But even so, cyclic AMP made in the cell lives only about 10 minutes before it gets hydrolyzed and goes back to regular AMP. Okay, so these cyclic nucleotides, that's what they are. Now the question is, what do these guys do? Well, these guys do cell regulation, and they work by Okay, cyclic nucleotides work this way. They bind to and activate these family of critical regulatory enzymes called the protein kinase A's or PKA's and or the protein kinase G's or PKG's. Now what we will find out later when we talk about protein regulation is protein kinases are critical regulatory proteins. They covalently attach phosphates to other proteins and that can do things like turn an enzyme on or off, open or close an ion channel in the membrane of the cell, activate or shut off a transcription factor that regulates genes, and just about anything else. You can regulate the cytoskeleton. Just about anything you want, there's a protein kinase out there that will regulate it. And here again, Protein kinases that are improperly activated are found in a number of human diseases, including many cancers. There are certain drugs that work very well on specific cancers because what they do is inhibit a specific protein kinase. That's a major factor in that type of cancer. And in a few cases, some of these drugs have turned what used to be a short-term fatal disease into a long-term chronic but treatable disease. Some of these have just been out in the market for five years or less. And there's others in the pipeline. Okay, so protein kinases are critically important regulatory proteins. The PKA and PKG families are regulated. They're activated by binding the appropriate cyclic nucleotide. And they do all kinds of diverse things in cells. So these are very, very important families of regulatory enzymes. So cyclic nucleotides have all kinds, when they're produced, they have all kinds of important regulatory functions. We'll see that more when we talk about signaling pathways, because some signaling pathways lead to the production of cyclic nucleotides when those pathways are activated. Okay, so that's the cyclic nucleotides. Next to the group of modified nucleotides are what we could call, well, a lot of times they're called coenzymes, but there are many different types of coenzymes. So I'm going to call these the nucleotide coenzymes just to narrow them down and say that some of these guys, these guys are modified nucleotides. <coughs> Now, the term coenzyme means it must be working in conjunction with some kind of enzyme. Indeed, they do that. 
They will associate with a particular with particular kinds of enzymes and perform important functions to help the enzyme out. We'll see what those functions are in just a minute. Nucleotide coenzymes mean that they are mod that these kind of modified nucleotides. There are other coenzymes that are not nucleotides, but we're just going to focus on these. Now we have probably heard of some of these things before, and they play numerous and diverse roles in cells. You may have heard of something called NADH, of something called FADH, of something called NADPH. Those are involved critical things in many metabolic processes. Virtually all energy producing metabolism, no matter what type, is going to use some of these nucleotide coenzymes. We find these coenzymes used as well in processes of breaking molecules down or synthesis of molecules. In many biosynthetic pathways, we need to use these nucleotide coenzymes. So there's all kinds of different things that these coenzymes are used for. Now, let's kind of make a crude drawing of one of these. What these guys are are actually a double nucleotide containing adenine. They're two nucleotides, one on one end and the other on the other. And they're separated by kind of like a spacer of carbons and sometimes nitrogens, and usually there's a sulfur or two in that thing. So picture something like a barbell. Okay, the bar is the spacer arm of carbons, nitrogens, and occasional sulfur. The weights on either end are the nucleotides. So I'm going to make a real crude drawing. Of course, you get some good drawings in the book, but I'm going to make a real crude drawing of a nucleotide coenzyme. We've got our sugar, the rivals here, <coughs> the base adenine, <coughs> coming off here, a phosphate, and then this sort of spacer arm which it contains mostly carbons, but you do have a sulfur to it that is critically important for their function as well. And then you have another phosphate here, and then you have another nucleotide here. Okay, with the adenine. Okay, so that's what we would see basically with things like NADH and NADPH and stuff like that. All right, so that's crude drawing of a nucleotide coenzyme. Questions? What does that say in the middle? Oh, spacer arm. Arm? Yeah, it's just a spacer. Like I say, it equivalent kind of like the bar on a set of weights on a barbell. Okay, now what do these guys do? What are they there for? They're why obviously widely used in all kinds of biological processes. Energy producing metabolism synthesis of all kinds of different molecules, and many times a breakdown of different kinds of molecules. Why are they so widely used? What do they do? Okay, well what they do is they either donate or receive electrons from other things. They donate or receive electrons during oxidation reduction reactions. And many times, for instance, energy producing metabolism, the majority of that is you end up taking something from the outside world, food in other words, and then you oxidize it, you remove electrons from that and break it down. And oxidation is generally an exergonic process. Now what do you do with those electrons? Remove electrons from these things, and you pass them to these coenzymes. And then those coenzymes can pass them to something else and release more energy. Likewise, when you're synthesizing things from scratch, you may have to do oxidation and or reduction reactions somewhere along that synthetic pathway or that breakdown pathway. Once again, here you have these coenzymes. They're either willing to pass electrons or they're willing to pick up electrons from something else. 
So they're widely used in all kinds of oxidation reduction reactions that are involved in every kind of thing from making things, breaking stuff down, energy producing metabolism, or what have you. An example of what happens here. Okay, let's take NADH. That's the, what we would call, reduced or electron-rich version. Now, what can happen is obviously is a reversible process. We remove two electrons from it, giving us a positively charged coenzyme ion, releasing a hydrogen ion, and then passing two electrons to something else. And this would be the oxidized version of the coenzyme. Oxidized. Okay. And this process is fully reversible. So NADH can provide two electrons to something, or we can pass two electrons and add an H plus to the oxidized version of it and go to NADH, back and forth. Now, the interesting thing about these coenzymes here, there's all kinds of diversity of life on this planet, and all kinds of diverse metabolic strategies. We're used to things where we consume organic molecules, break them down, combine them effectively with oxygen, and generate the energy we need. Or we're used to organisms that soak up light energy, and use that to produce energy-rich molecules, photosynthesis. But there are many kinds of microorganisms that can do some very oddball things to keep alive. Some of them will take carbon dioxide and hydrogen gas, or hydrogen rich organic molecule, like say acetic acid or formic acid, and convert it into methane, natural gas. That gives them a little energy, not much, but enough for them to go by. Some of them can take hydrogen sulfide, what we often call rotten egg gas, which smells appropriately nasty, and is also toxic to most organisms. For some microorganisms, that's dinner. They will take and oxidize the hydrogen sulfide, removing electrons from it, and that gives them the energy they need. And then they end up depositing either elemental sulfur or if there's oxygen around, things like sulfate ions and leave deposit in the water. There are other organisms that can remove electrons from metals like iron, copper, magne manganese, even chromium, which is considered a toxic pollutant. There's something that even use arsenic in its metabolism. And many times what you're doing is oxidizing these metals, removing electrons from them, passing to something else, and getting a little bit of the energy of oxidation, enough to get by. Those kinds of organisms often live in some really hostile environments. Volcanic hydrothermal vents, metal-laden, hot, toxic water. There's something they found that, lived in, that lives in and uses metal oxidation as a strategy. It lives in this water. It's a runoff from this old abandoned mine in California. That water is so nasty that, by law, it should be collected and taken to a toxic waste dump. It is loaded up with all kinds of metals, including nasty things like chromium and large amounts of copper and stuff like that. It is so acidic, it is literally as acidic as battery acid. You take a bath in that water, it will eat holes in your skin. Yet there are microbes that live in that and use the metals essentially as a food source. Okay. Now the interesting thing, all these diverse metabolic strategies and stuff, if you look at them, every single one of them, you're going to find these coenzymes being used to pick up or donate electrons. So that's telling you something very important. The use of these coenzymes is universal to all life on this planet. Every living organism we know of uses these same set coenzymes, and one or two more, for, uh, to support oxidation reduction reactions. So the use of these must go back to the dawn of life on this planet itself, long before there was any fossil evidence of that. So we're talking 3.5 to maybe 4 billion years ago that nature discovered the powerful abilities of these things and have been using them ever since. Now, an interesting question for the biology types. If we found life on Mars or somewhere else in the solar system, would they use the same or perhaps similar coenzymes? That would be one of those fundamental questions of life. Would some kind of alien life use coenzymes the way we do, or perhaps even the same type? 
when they use DNA to store metabol uh, to store genetic information or some kind of similar model? Those would be big, the first big questions to ask if we found any signs of life uh, beyond the Earth. And there's a few possible places, Mars and that uh, moon of Jupiter called Europa, that potentially could have some kind of primitive life. We won't know for sure until we go out there and dig big holes in the ground or melt through lots of ice, but it's possible. So those would be some of the big, big questions to ask if we ever found something like that. How do they differ from us? Because all life on this planet has certain fundamental features. And use of these coenzymes for electron donation or receipt is one of those universal features. Okay, well, that covers our modified nucleotides, our major families of modified nucleotides. Now, clearly, we'll use nucleotide triphosphates to make nucleic acids. And that probably is a great time to take a 10, 12-minute break. So that's what we'll do at this point.